All right. We'll give it a second to spool up. Just, uh, this is about a minute early, which means I have some time to read. Yeah, we're going to have to speed up a little bit, huh? That's fine. We'll get to four at least. We got to get your temple burning down and we'll be good. And more people dying. Great, looks like we're live again. Any major issues? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's on, it's live. Looks good to go. I got my beverages redone. Hey, that's King Kakuji. Yeah, aerial shot. Again, not my picture. It's just a cool picture. It's nice. If you've never been there, it's a gold, literally just a gold temple. Very austere. No, it's not. But it's a fun tourist location. You can walk around the lake. It's nice. Uh, just don't go... Okay, I'm going to be honest. Nowadays, I don't know. I, I would definitely say I wouldn't go when all the Chinese have holiday. Just because they really like it. And there's like a million of them. When I first went, Japan was still kind of like small popular. What was in the last five years? There's been like a 500% increase in Chinese tourists over the last five years. Before Corona, I mean. But I went off season two years ago. It was still pretty chill. That was nice. It was busy, but not as it wasn't as chill as like 12 years ago when I went anyway. So another old person bitching about the good old days. I know, I know. All right. So let's jump on in. Yep. Well, I make a joke whenever people complain too much about Chinese tourists. I just say, ah, the Chinese are the new Japanese tourists. <laughs> Same thing happened post-war Japan. Right there everywhere. So it, 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 tourism has pros and cons, and I'm not gonna, it's nothing to do with this class. All I can say, in the Heike, there was not tourists. All right. So the pardon, let's jump on in. Uh, this this one just gets into the politics where that sotaba goes around and then who gets pardoned and who doesn't. And for those of you who have the weird translation, this is in 1178, if you're curious. And, um, oh yeah, and in this one too, we one reason we get the parting, this is very interesting, but uh, Kiyomori's daughter is married to an emperor. Let me say it again. Kiyomori's daughter is married to an emperor. Then she gets pregnant. Ah. Now, when you get pregnant, what do you want? Well, in the old days, it actually, they liked men and women in Japan. However, if you're Kiyomori and all you want is more power, like you already control everything, but not literally everything, you want your daughter, who's married to the emperor, to have a son, so you're the grandfather of an emperor. That's what you want. So they basically apply magic now. I'm not even kidding. Like, the daughter gets possessed and they have to do several exorcisms. Uh, take a look at this channel, chat. So there's religion and politics in this one, actually. Now, in addition, though, Shigamori recommends to recall exiles and forgive all the people they just killed because they've angered the spirits and the spirits will mess with the birth. Interesting. So, on that island, if you remember our friends... Let me get those pictures back... So, uh, we have Yasuyori, Shunkan, and uh, Nagatsune, I think, the son. Uh, and we get a partial pardon. Isn't that great? Yeah, everybody gets pardoned except for Shunkan. And when I say everyone, I mean literally everybody except one guy gets a pardon. <laughs> his crimes are just too much. And actually, it's interesting, his crimes were being a corrupt Buddhist monk. Right, he like ran a monastery and robbed from his people. So Stamping and Frenzy is just the chapter where Shun Kong gets really pissed off they didn't take him. And the picture's awesome, so I want to show it. Here's him. This is them sailing away, and he is sl waving a stick saying, Please take me! Ah! And actually, Naritsune, uh, or is it Narichika? I always mess the two up. Let me see. Oh yeah, Naritsune. 
So Naritsune, who is the son, Naritsune gets away, and he reassures this guy, don't worry, man, when we get back to the capital, we'll tell him about you. And somehow they calm him down, but he still, like, shakes in wrath. He's pissed off that they left him on the island. And remember, this is the being a Buddhist story, right? He's the non-religious one. <laughs> so he was just chilling while the other guys were praying and throwing their sotoba in the water. And then he's the one who gets to stay. Just, uh... There's some commentary there if you're a Buddhist or any kind of religious person, which is pretty funny. All right, next one. Ooh, here we go. Um, we get the imperial birth, obviously. This is an important one, right? So the the two exiles we get to know make it back. Um, the, the There's a birth of an emperor. There's lots of tension. There's talks about amnesty here. Um, the cloister emperor prays a bunch. It shows you, like, just the... If you want to see the ritual around like how much work it took to have babies in the old days and how they kind of felt about it and why there was good and bad luck there's literally prayers against possession why because the Heike have done so many bad things to people the spirit of the people they've wronged want to take possession of the woman and mess with her pregnancy basically so all the Buddhists and all the yin and yang masters are on full alert in the capital and somehow they get a great birth of a boy. Isn't that great? Well, don't worry, it doesn't end. Oh, we get the roster of the great lords. I'm not worried about that one. We're going to skip that one. But then we get the rebuilding of the great pagoda. And this one's where we get a little bit of Kiyomori's background in Ikutsushima. Like, why do they have a connection? And generally, this the story isn't linear always. It tends to have random times. It goes back in time. Yeah, and it's showing him about his inspiration. He had a dream where he had to rebuild this. This is where he got his magical spear. It's also when he got warnings. And so he's he's told to rebuild them. Uh, where is this war? I love the warning here. So he actually has like an old monk come visit him, and like a like a he has like a sight of a three hundred year old dead monk, basically. Um, and he does almost all the devotions. But the problem is, he still has... Like, when he's given the lance. He's given a lance in his dream, and it was there. And he says, Did you heed me, or have you forgotten what I told you through the holy man? And this is the end of... This is on 148. If you conduct yourself ill, however, you will do your descendants no good. With these words, the goddess ascended. What a marvelous thing to happen. So, he has some divine favor. This is what we learned about Kiyomori. He has definitely a support, and in his time, he can be pious. Now, we get some interesting uh, asides here. Go Shirokawa gets this monk, Raijo, who's from a place called uh, Mirera, but don't worry about that right now. Um, he gets him to pray for Go Shirokawa to have a son. Isn't that great? It's great. And then he says, I'll give you anything you want if it works. He asks, basically, can my temple have the power to be like a head temple? Can we promote monks? And he consults his politics and says, no. And then Rigel says, great, if you don't give that to me, I'm going to fast until I die. And if I die, your son dies. And the emperor's like, oh, crap. Well, can we speak talk sense to him? They try, and it doesn't work. And then... It fails, and his son dies. And then he does round two, where he goes to Mount Hei instead, and prays. And this time he gets a son, and doesn't stiff them. But again, this one's just interesting too. It shows you, like, people are trying to negotiate with the spiritual realm, and for these people it really worked. But also, they're, they're kind of flippant about their errors, which is uh, kind of interesting. But again, we're, we're getting more character of Go Shirakawa, of Kiyomori. It's, you know, it's uh, very much outlining the tension. And this Imperial Birth will make more sense later as we get there. All right. Uh, now we get Naritsune's return. Yay! The exile who was stuck on the island. And we actually have a picture for that. It's in the book too, but I took all these pictures, so... Here's Naritsune returning to his family. And it's kind of low res. It's low res in the book too. They're all super happy, and I think it's just an excuse to show us nature, right? 
But again, Naratsune actually makes it back. But not only does Naratsune make it back, he actually goes to find his father before he goes to his family, and his friend from the island comes with him. And uh, he attempts to find his father. He finds his father's notes. His father had a notebook, basically, in a house and his grave. And he builds a shrine for his father, basically, and respects his dad. Very pious. And he basically does the proper observance. And then he goes to his father's mansion, which, if you don't know anything about wood mansions, right, they degrade pretty quick over time. And he finds his father's half-degraded mansion and just spends a couple days remembering him. And then Yasuyori, his friend from the island who's still with him and is just loving this, he actually has problems leaving his friend. It's just the companionship here is just so, after suffering together, it's hard to, like, leave each other. There's a, where's the quote here? Um... 154. Oh yeah, and he writes a poem for his dad. He says, Once was my own once was my home, and if this world of ours should such blossoms could speak, ah what questions I could ask about those days long ago. So he's making uh, this is a uh, not Natsu, making a poem about his dad. And yes, you already also moved. And then we get them coming back to their homes. And uh, he has two kids now, Naritsune. He's super happy. And Yasuyori, interestingly enough, he finds his own villa and he writes a little bit of poetry too because that's what Japanese classic people do. Um, long, this is uh, Yasuyori now. Here at my old home, moss so thick as a carpet overgrows the eaves. Far less moonlight than I thought comes in through the cracks. And actually he retires and writes a... Uh, a Buddhist epic of his own. But, again, you get a kind of happy ending, but he destroys his father's, like, exile home, and then we get this interesting example of friendship, and also we get an example of kind of, like, how you tribute to your dead father, and, you know, how do you show respect, and how people react emotionally to their families. And the homecoming is very touching, if you'd like to read it. Uh, I think it's pretty good. And uh, so it's more character building. Although I'm pretty sure Natsune comes back later. Okay, now we get Adio. Adio is a loyal follower of Shunkan, who's the third guy stuck on that poor island. Um, and he basically decides to go find his master. And he talks to his daughter and gets the daughter to write a letter. He then he try he basically by hook or by crook gets all the way to Kyushu, that island at the south of Japan. And he gets robbed along the way, it's pretty bad. And then he finally gets the island. He can barely talk to the locals. And then he sees this crazy guy come out of the woods. And he finds his master. And when he finds his master, his master basically collapses immediately. Because he thinks it's a dream. But, th this kind of tells us that... Uh, how can I say it? This, is, this tells us what happens. Oh yeah, and part of uh, um, Shunkan's punishment is we get the kind of religious karma here in the end of uh, 3.8. Where it talks about that he appropriated honest offerings to the Buddha. That's his real punishment. That's why he never got to leave the island. Now, Shunkan talks about his family. He learns that his son died, and then his wife died while he was gone. And his daughter was still alive. And then he basically stops eating. And for the first time, Shunkan becomes a real monk. Shunkan prays, and then dies quickly. And then Audio buries him, travels back to his daughter. And then the daughter and him become monks. And then this is where we start to get the, the prefiguring of where the story's going to go. It says, having heaped such grief on so many, the Heike, uh, the Heike follow a frightening end, or they their pre their presage of frightening end. So the Heike's end is already starting to come, and you think that's it? Well, no. But Ariel finds Shukan, Shukan dies, daughter becomes a nun. Very tragic. So, but we start to see like the effects of Heike action, right? People are dying, people are suffering, even Natsune and his friend coming back. One retires forever, and one's his dad is dead, right? And he barely has anything. It's not great. And then we get to, literally, nature starts getting pissed off. Um, this is Whirlwind. It destroys parts of the capital, and the chapter basically talks about how it's kind of showing conflict is coming. A lot of people and ox die too, apparently. So, again, this is that kind of karmic idea where we're that, that the cycle itself is starting to attack the Heike, because the Heike basically control the capital now. So, 
Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, now we start to get in a little bit depressing stuff. Let me see. Any questions? Nope. Uh, people are just chilling. Okay. Uh, now we get into a bit of... Oh, oop, don't close that. A bit of... Uh, this is where we get a, a sad turn of the story. It's three... Point three chapter book three chapter eleven is to consult or not the Chinese physician. We made that tourist joke earlier, but uh, now we have our one tourist in the whole story. Now, Lord Shigamori, basically the only good guy on the Heike team, is a pretty religious man, and he prays for penance for his father's acts. And his prayer is simple: he prays for reform or death. He asked the gods, and I'll figure out where he was praying. Let's see. Okay, he went to a, a, a pilgrimage to Kumano, which is a big temple for one of his, uh, for Kyoto in general. And he says, I observe that my father, the novice and chief minister, conduct, conducts himself evilly and unjustly, persecuting at times the sovereign himself. As his eldest son, I remonstrate him often. As we learned that word before, right? But I lack the wit to change his ways. Such is his behavior that I fear even for his own glory, and I cannot imagine his successors adding luster to either his name or theirs. Unworthy as I am, these then are my thoughts. Should I, like any mediocrity, merely follow the prevailing tide, I would stray from the ways proper to a good official and a filial son, far better than to forsake thoughts of greatness, to withdraw, abandoning glory for this life, and instead seek enlightenment. Being a man as weak and benign as any other, and confused about right and wrong, I have never done what I truly aspire to do. And then he, he prays, this is 164, he prays for the whole page. He basically says, fix it or kill me. And then um, Kiyomori actually offers him aid. He's like, hey, we have this Chinese doctor, don't die. And then there's this visiting physician, he can help him. And Shigamori basically gives a long answer. And he says, tell my father that I've respectfully heeded his words regarding medical intervention. Now let me hear you mine. And uh, he says, why sovereign throw he surely was. Oh, he gives, uh, let's see. Oh, man. And he gives like a two-page reason while it will hurt the, basically hurt the pride of Japan if he takes this help. But more importantly, his, if his karmic weight is that thick, he can't live anyway. Where's the end of his spiel here? Oh, and more than anything else, for a minister of the realm, casually to consult a visitor by chance present here from abroad. That would first bring shame unto our country, and second, degrade our ways. Not even at the cost of my life would I wish to embarrass our land. Tell my father that. So he basically is able to make a why he loves Japan so much argument for his dad to not have the minister minister to him, or the sub-doctor. And he respects his decision. And Shigamori becomes a monk, which is apparently his life's dream, and dies of an illness. And then we learn, as we've seen from some of the examples, in the lesser and the greater remonstrance, right? We saw that today. Shigemori was the only thing keeping the peace. So, he died, and that's not going to be good for the rest of the story, as in keeping peace. And there's a, there's, a, there's a final commemorative here. And if you notice in the story, sometimes we don't get character introductions till after they're gone. It's very... Japanese kind of novelization almost. They'd rather give you the character, his whole arc, and then with flashbacks tell you why he was great. So that's actually the next couple chapters. I'll, I'll give you the highlights. Okay. Oh, and as per normal, any questions you have, you can feel free to ask me. I think I see one pinging. Uh, Kiyomori. Yeah, Kiyomori. Oh, did I say, did I write it wrong? Let me see. I may have. I have a lot of slide errors. Kiyo. Kiyo, because there's no spell check for Japanese names. Oh, yep, that's Kiyomori right there. Yep, good catch. Uh, do I want to fix it? Yeah, probably, because otherwise next year I definitely won't. I definitely won't look. Yeah, Kiyo. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Great. It's fixed. Good catch, Jeffrey. 
All right, not me, another Jeffrey. All right, good catch. Okay, so we did this one. Now, moving on. Um, we now get a little bit of flashback. He's dead, but we get uh, Kiyomori's, uh, Shigemori's, a little bit of Shigemori's flashback of his life. First, uh, 312, we learn he has a dream, and he basically has the ability to see the fall of his house, and he tells his oldest son it and gives him a sword, which is like the commemorative sword for when he dies. Um, also, to show you how good of a Buddhist he is, we have the lanterns where Shigemori aspired to have good karma, so he built a giant temple complex. And he, he was so devout on following his observations to the temple, they called him like the Lantern Prince. And finally, to hedge his bets, he even built, sent like 3,000 bars of gold to China to pay a Buddhist temple there to pray for his soul. And uh, it's, and these all three basically are about his merit. If you want to dig into them more, they're very interesting. And the, not only did the the temple say yes, he gave money to buy land from the emperor, who also said yes. And as far as we know, when this book is written, they were still praying for him. Knowing how tradition works, they may have been praying to, for him till like the 20th century. You never know. But again, we talked about can you pray for the dead in Buddhism? Yes, if you chant for the dead, it can have effect on their karma through the cycles in a good way. So it's just showing us, oh, Shigemori's a good guy. Oops. And now he's gone. So now we get uh, more things. This one. <laughs> so, okay. The the confrontation with Joka. This one we get. Joken. Um, basically the loss of his son, his favorite son, and his best son, right? Shigemori's his best son. Pushes Kiyomori to despair, and then he starts ch marching on the capital. And this is when he just finally, he arrests the cloistered emperor, and he has a bunch of reasons for it. And uh, why we have uh, the confrontations with Jokin. Jokin is the closer Emperor's ambassador, who Kiyomori basically tries to scare into submission. And uh, he's another monk, by the way. And he defends himself well. And how do you know people are monks? They tend to have, I, I would say, two syllable names, but it's more correct to say they have two Chinese character names. Because this is a four syllable name, right? Jokin. But. In Chinese, it'd be two syllables. So when somebody becomes a monk, they take a monastic name, which is two characters from China that are like have spiritual significance, basically. So Jokin basically confronts uh, Kiyomori effectively. Now we start to get Kiyomori's plan happens. He banishes even more ministers. He kicks them out. A lot of these ministers are also Fujiwara. If you remember, the Fujiwara are the old regents. So he fires a bunch of regents, puts his own guys in place. He just doubles down on running everything. Alright, and let's see. Yukitaka. Okay, so this is where we start to see Kiyomori's kind of... Uh, randomness. So he attempts to arrest a boy and his dad, or a, you know, family. Let's see, one eighty. So this is starting to get the breakdown of the power. So basically, his only thing in his own family holding him back was Shigemori, who was a great guy and now is dead, right? And before that, you could say the emperor might have slowed him down, but after this round of firing, he's basically firing all the rest of the emperor's power. Oh, we had a random question. Let me see. Since you adopt the religious Chinese name, is that you're stuck for life as long as you're a monk? So, like we did in the pillow book, right? People have multiple names. You have your title. You have your father's name. You have kind of a nickname, right? Even in our story, right? The Heike are also the Taira. Like, they have two names. So, even your own family name, you'll have two names. So, it's another layer of names. Does that make sense? So it's just an additional name. Now, if the person's a good monk, the story will refer to them as their monk name. But for example, Kiyomori is a monk with a monk name, and they never refer to him as the monk name, unless it's Buddhists saying what a bad Buddhist he is. 
because he never actually acts like a monk. So you kind of call the person, it's all, if you've never studied Japanese, um, it's like the language. What you call someone is completely based on the setting and your relationship to them and the age power differential between two people. Yeah, they would cast their former name aside. That's the, what you're supposed to do, right? Because it's called renouncing the world, if you haven't read it yet. It says that all the time, right? So X or Y person renounce the world. So that's what you do. You're supposed to shave your head, give all your stuff away, and be a monk forever. Now, not only did Kiyomori do this wrong, the emperor did it wrong, right? If the emperor is retired, and he's a monk, why is he... Why does he still have a court? Why is he still making promotions? Doesn't sound very Buddhist monkey to me. And again, that's the Buddhist critique of that system, but it's also a practical critique, right? Like if you have two courts actively working at the same time, you're not doing a very good thing for the power either, right? Like if three or four different people have the same titles or they're competing, uh, that's bad. Uh, for next time, I'll actually make a graphic to kind of explain how the dual or triple courts work here. It's 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 super intense. So it. Even the emperor is being a bad, the cloistered emperor is being a bad Buddhist too, because he's supposed to give everything up as well. Alright, so Yuritaka, this one's depressing. But we get two, there's a little pre-story, let me find this. Uh, I have my picture. Oh, we have that one too. Oh yeah, oh, the thing that made, uh, by the way, poor Shigemori. One reason he gave the sword to his son is he actually had a dream, this picture. This is him in his dream, and these are the people in the dream. They're carrying his dad's head as a celebratory, like, ah, oh, he's an evil man, we killed him, yay! So he actually had a dream knowing his dad was evil and he's going to be punished for it someday. Uh, the next one, we have this picture. So the first half of this chapter, a guy called To Nari and Ie Nari kill themselves in burning their house. Why? Because they know they're going to be arrested and exiled or killed by Kiyomori. So they just take themselves out. So this is where you start to see, it's getting hardcore. Like, people have nothing to lose anymore. If you're going to, like, kill yourself and burn your house down, like, they're taking this seriously, right? Because think about it, you're not just losing your job. You're losing everything if you're lucky. If you're exiled, you have nothing. And your family has no income. Because you've lost your position, right? So your family's going to starve or suffer at best. And that's if they don't kill you. So now we're getting people just killing themselves in the fire because to resist. And then the second half, that we actually get this guy, Yukitaka. He's a guy who's just been ignored for a long time, and Kiyomori promotes him for no reason. <laughs> so Kiyomori is basically getting erratic. That's what we're learning. Doesn't mean he's not effective, but he's erratic. All right. Now, officially now, the cloistered emperor, this is Goshitakawa, the guy who had the second court. The emperor now, in 318, finally gets exiled. And he gets out, exiled without his court. But if you remember, these the ministers banished are all his ministers. These poor guys who kill themselves are his ministers. So by this point, the Cloistered Emperor's lost a lot of his power. And he's now exiled to an old palace that's basically run down and has, like, no retainers. Nobody's there to, like, keep an eye on him. And that's too bad. So the Cloistered Emperor now is kind of out of the picture for the moment. Let me see, is there anything else I want to talk about here? Nope, all right. So here we go. So this is the ultimate power move, basically. Okay, somebody asked, what does Cloistered Emperor mean? All right, so the, the book will call him, so Cloistered, we'll do, we'll break it. Cloistered is a monk. It's the title for one who, if you're a nobility who becomes a monk, you're now Cloistered. To join the Cloister, means you joined a monastery. So in the book, it calls him actually his cloistered eminence. Eminence is the title you give to a retired emperor. I'm not this, I can't make this up. And cloistered means a monk. So cloistered eminence is a retired emperor who's a monk. If that makes sense for that question. Yes, these are all, we're, we're, we're about, 105 years from kind of the end of monarchy so two generations ago all these titles would have been very automatic 
If you want to know more, um, I can give you some select readings from European history where you can learn more about monarchy. It's, it's interesting. For all we know, it might be coming back. But so this cloistered emperor gets exiled. And then we get the Sanon Detached Palace. And this is where we get a little father-son interaction, actually. Okay, so first, the son, who is the emperor, so Goshirakawa's son threatens to become a wandering ascetic monk. Seriously, he threatens to become a monk, and his dad convinces him not to. Where's my notes here? And we get some interesting political theory here. Um, this is where we get the uh, quote. So he says, uh, what good for do to me stay here in my August abode? I want to flee the world, become an ascetic, wandering the mountains and forest. And the cloistered emperor, Go Shudakawa, replies, please give up any such notion. Simply knowing that you are there to me as a source of comfort. Who else would be left to me were used to vanish from sight? Be patient, rather. Watch and wait until the old man's fate is sealed. And he also says this. This is where I, I mentioned this quote earlier. Uh, so the emperor puts the letter to his face, cries into it, and then he writes this. The sovereign is a ship, his people water. Water keeps the ship afloat. Water can capsize it as well. Subjects sustain the sovereign. Subjects also overthrow him. And he gives more examples of how things have gone badly. And talks about... Um, from earlier days there were only gentlemen left alive and they convinced that things stood no good could ever come from court service even perhaps one day as counselors had in the prime of their manhood turned their backs on the world and he gives even more examples but he basically convinces his son to not give everything up yet um yeah that's what happens so is there anything else i'm missing here Lots of Chinese illusions, if you're curious, and just talks about like a lot of the political science of what was expected of an emperor. So we get a little dad-son interaction, and they actually meet in the next one, and which we're going to jump into now. Bink. All right. Any questions as we go? Feel free to ask. Like, what is a cloistered emperor? Is actually a great question because you should know. And it looks like we got enough time to get where I want to get. I'd like to get at least to what's that one called? I'm looking through my notes. Um, yep. So we're going to get to the burning of Midera today. Uh, basically a great temple burning is going to happen for the next two chapters. But I want to get to the first one. Because again, remember this is a Buddhist epic. So the more things that are being burned, the worse it is for things. Alright. So now we get... The pilgrimage of to Itsuku Tsushima, and this is in 1180. Now, within the first three days of the new year, this emperor, who's in his 20s, is forced to retire. The one we just heard about, who got that letter from his dad. Kiyomori has his way in all things. And as he quoted, the age is ours, and he can do what he wants. Well, I mean, okay, burning any kind of religious thing is bad, right? But for, from the Buddhist perspective, we already had that quote before, where the monks said, like, first the Buddhist way goes, and then the sovereign way. So they basically have, like, a theology that, like, once good Buddhism goes out the window, society then collapses. There's correction, right? Politics collapses, and then society collapses. Because what's the origin of order, right? It's the sovereign. Now, again, some of you might be libertarian and say, no, the order of society is from us. But, okay... The Buddhists are basically arguing the first order comes from people being pious, right? If all your people are good Buddhists, you're not going to have that much chaos. And then if the Buddhists lose it, eventually the emperor is going to lose it. And then everybody loses it, right? Then it's just bandits for 400 years. And I know, I know it's funny. We probably have a couple anarcho-communists or anarcho-libertarians here. I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical, that's all I'm going to say. Show me the money, right? Show me where everything doesn't just turn into Somalia, or, let's be honest, Japan after the tale of the Heike. <laughs> and if you're curious, I think it's uh, from 1180 to 
1600. It's basically warlords. So, I mean... The Buddhists are right? <laughs> okay, so let's jump on in. So the emperor got forced to retire, basically. For his two-year-old son. Now, why would that happen? Well, the youth emperor... This is a bad precedent. Everybody thought it was a bad idea. But the new emperor is the blood of Kiyomori, right? It's Kiyomori's daughter's son. So, he, and this emperor they're forcing to retire is her husband. So, they're forcing the emperor who sired a son to retire. And there's nothing anybody can do now. The emperor's gone. The Heike control all of Kyoto. Most of the court appointments. They have no power. So, as kind of a power play... Do I have it on here? Let's see. Oh, yeah. And Kiyomori is, gets his way in all things. And all the Heike basically think, This age is ours! We can't lose! Uh, spoiler! I'm going to give you... It's, it's from art, but I've yet to see it wrong. If you're ever having a competition, or you're ever in real life, of politics, anything, as soon as you say, You get your way in all things, and this age is ours... Everything starts to go to crap. I don't know why. That's just the nature of reality, folks. It's not just this Buddhist epic. It's basically everything. As soon as you get self-confident and fat and happy, and all your competition disappears, man, humans just fall off a freaking cliff. Like this book. Within two years, everything goes to poop. It's just... <laughs> it's literature giving us advice on real life again. So if you ever... If you're like, no, when I win, I won't lord it over people and send the emperor into exile and control everything. I'm a great person. This is kind of the literature teaching us a lesson point. And if you don't like that, this is a great place to argue. So, to remind you, Ikitsushima is the shrine of the Heike. So the emperor basically goes, the retired emperor is going to do a pilgrimage here. It's basically a power move too. And they're interesting here, we get a talk. This is pretty cool. Let me see where this is. For the first time in a long time, the Emperor gets to visit his dad, which is very interesting. And the best part, we don't have any recording of it. We don't have any recording. They just, he gets a chance to see his dad, they cry together, and two retired Emperors sit together and have a nice little chat. And he does his trip, he well accounts himself, we even get this story, where is this? I'm going to show you another picture. I love these pictures. It's sad that I can't show more of them. Four, two. Is this it? Oops. Oh, yeah, we'll show this one in a second. It's from the return. All right. And somebody asked the question, but wait, with peace times in China and Japan, were they able to devolve more in the arch and literature? No. Okay, but here's the thing. Right, um, it's not that peace doesn't make more arts and literature. It's okay. Anybody maniacal enough to say the age is ours always seems to fall. Right, any peaceful time of any country. How can I say it? It tends to not have maniacal guys at the top. There might be absolute rulers, but like. It never works when that guy tries to give, like, every job to his family. Does that make sense? Like, you you try to totally crush your appointments, give everything to your friends and your family, you know. It tends to collapse. Not, not even just cocky, but there's, like, a moderate... Pr Catholics would call it prudence, right? There's like, a, there's, like, using your wisdom, right? Like, should I really crush everybody? No, you, you can't, right? We, we, humans literally lack the capacity to kill all their enemies. At some point, uh, like we talked about earlier today, at some point you're going to kill too many people. When Shigomori gave his dad advice, right? He's like, dude, if you kill everyone, everybody's going to kill you back. Because everybody has kids and families. And even this book mentions it. A lot of the anger against the Heike is not that they have power. It's that they over they pass over people that are in position to get the job and are more qualified than the family members. That's when they start to lose their power, is unjust promotions or demotions. So that's like, so this, this chapter three and four, when Kiyomori just starts to lose it, that's when they get, they piss the most people off and actually get a fight against them. All right, and that's a great question. Let's keep going. All right, so now we get the return, where the emperor goes back to... He goes to the shrine and has a great time, and he's a charming man, and he does a lot of poetry. Uh, 
And uh, on the return, we get the, a couple interesting... Uh, he actually tries to leave this temple. Let me find this uh, temple picture. Where did I put it? Here we go. So this is on his. This is him on the boat leaving. That's the emperor, by the way. Um, but he actually tries to leave, and the gods of the shrine won't let him leave, and they have to do a poem to escape. Not even kidding. It says, uh, Nor is our wish to go away. We would stay at Arinoura to receive from the white waves the blessing of the divine. They have to, like, bribe the god. They have to, like, convince the gods we had a good time. And this is just a cool picture. It just kind of shows, like, what a beautiful imperial boat looks like. This is what it looks like. And some guy brings them flowers, and they have a poetry competition. It's pretty funny. Um, but it's kind of a side tangent, so I'm not going to waste too much time on it. But it's a great full-page shot. And, right, it kind of shows the, these full-page pictures, if you're curious. If you ask yourself the question, which stories did Japanese for the next 800 years find important? You ready? If it got a full-page picture, it was a popular story. And this one is it's an aside story, but it kind of shows you the character of the retired emperor. Right, he's a good guy. He's well-educated. He's loyal to his dad. He didn't even go to the shrine to be cynical. He actually went to the shrine... Because he's a religious man, right? Like So we get kind of, he is a good character. All right. Now, now we get this. The roster of the Genji. You're like, oh, the Genji are entering. Great. So why do we have this? Well, the Genji approach a guy called Mochihito, who's a prince. He's one of the sons of the newly retired emperor. And they basically convince this guy. He's very artistic, not a fighter. But loyal to his country. And they, they the roster of the Genji is showing them all the Genji power there is if he just let joins them. So he brings an offer to support Prince Mochihito on his uprising. It's like the Heike are so corrupt you gotta let us fight. So the Genji are the competition. And Yorimasa is the head of one of the branches of the family. And he convinces them to basically start a rebellion. And let's see. All right, and then we get. Oh, I missed that, huh? Let's see. Do do for the master of the Gendry. So okay, they they get the they get the support. They bring their offer. Uh, we get our first battle actually in the provinces, and the Heike lose. Shockingly enough, so the 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 the, the Genji's power is not in the capital. They're very much a rural family. They've been kicked out of the capital and they have to live in the side provinces. So they have to rally their support base from all these provinces. And some of the Heike supporters hear about it, they have a big fight, the Heike lose. So the first battle isn't going well for them. Now, we get some interesting, uh, we get a chapter literally called The Weasels, I love this so much. They invade the cloistered emperor's home, and he writes down all the patterns of their running, and sneaks it to a yin and yang master. And he basically gets... And he'll, he'll, he basically says he gets the answer. In three days, you'll get a good answer. You'll get a good omen and a bad one. And the cloister emperor like, that's great. I'm going to get each. What's the good news? He finally has to come back to the capital. What's the bad news? He's like, gosh, now I have to wait for the other shoe to fall. No. And that's where we get this one. Um, his son, Mochihito, Mochihito gets uh, found out. They know he's going to rebel. So now they're chasing his son. Now, how'd they find out? Well, the Genji were going across the countryside recruiting, right? And they're saying, hey, look, Mochihiro is going to join us if we, you know, if we do this rebellion. Is it Hiro or Hito? I think it is Hito. I think I did it wrong in my notes. Let me confirm. Do, 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 do. Notes. Here we go. Yeah, it is Mochihito. My notes are, the notes are wrong. So yeah, Mochihito gets found out, basically. And he, him and the Genji supporters make him escape to Mireira. It's one of the competing temples in the capital. And he almost forgets his flute. Aw, this shows you his character. He's a famous artist. Now, why does this get called Nobutsura? Well, um, we get our first cool fight. Nobutsura is barely ready to fight, but he goes back to fight. And, uh... Let's just say he lives well, and I think he, with a ceremonial sword, he manages to kill like 15 guys. And then he finally gets captured and stands up for himself, and I think they finally kill him. Let me see, 211. I'm pretty sure they behead him, which is very common. If you've ever heard of a head count, right, that's where it comes from, like from China. You literally count the heads of the dead.
Okay, so here we go. He fights as he gets captured finally. The Hey K Warriors present murmured amongst themselves. What a man, they said. Oh, it would be too bad to behead a man like that. Last year, you know, someone put in. When on duty at the Emperor's, he went off alone after six robbers that the other guards hadn't been able to stop. Cut down four, took two prisoner. That's how he got an officer's post. Yes, he's a man to face a thousand. You can certainly say that. They all told one another's story that they... How sorry they'd be to see him executed, whereupon Lord Kirmori, for reasons only known to himself, banished him to Hino. So he gets banished, he doesn't die, sorry. And eventually, Yoritomo, one of the uh, Minamoto, aka the Genji, find him and make him a governor, because the story's so awesome. So Nobusuda is like one of the happy endings for just being a loyal man and fighting to the end. Okay, next person we get. Oh, Kyo, yeah, oh man. This one. Oof. Okay, so Kyo, um, so when Mochi Hito's escaping, uh, Kyo's one of his followers who basically shows up too late. Oops. And uh, he gets captured. And then Munemori, one of the, one of the Genji, say, come on, man. Oh, here we go. Yeah, he returns late, joins Munemori. And then Munimori's like, yeah, go bait the Mo Mochihito and his followers. We'll, uh, it'll be great. And then he basically, oh, by, before he does this, by the way, he burns his home, sends his family to safety, goes to Midera, and he was given a sweet horse, by the way. And and he, uh, then we get to learn a subplot. If you like horses, you're not going to like this part. But this whole battle is actually started off the back of a horse, a.k.a. Munemori basically stole a horse from one of the Genji. Uh, it was a beautiful horse, and he demanded it, and his dad, and ba he had to give it to them because the Genji were more, Heike were more powerful. And so, as revenge, they basically send Munemori's horse back, as, and they branded it and send it back to the Heike. Why? Well, when Munemori stole the, he the Heike's horse, they actually called it, they, they renamed the horse after the guy they stole it from. So every time they hit it or something, they're like, Ha ha, look, we stole this horse. Ugh. So they branded the horse back as Munemori. Uh, is it as beautiful as Lubu's horse? Neither of these horses are Lubu's horse, but they love it more than Lubu loved his horse. That's what matters. The emotion is stronger. So they basically bait him with a horse. And now they're all hiding in this Buddhist temple with Buddhist monks who support the new uh, the prince. He's not the emperor. He's a he could be emperor, but he's one of the princes. And now, uh, and by the way, this picture comes from one of our scenes we're going to see today. It's a bridge fight, which is super awesome. Uh, appeal to Mount Hei. So now we get two appeals. Um, if you're curious, you can they're they're actually reprinted. I'm going to look for mine. They're reprinted in full here, and actually, it's the one time we get to see Kiyomori's Buddhist name. Let's see. Oh yeah, so this is uh, 219 on the letter to Nara. It says, um, At present, Lord Taira no Kiyomori, known religiously as Jokai, arbitrarily aggregates himself in authority over the realm, lays weights to his majesty's government, and within provokes bitterness and lamentation. So both of these appeals are... How would you say it? Both of these appeals are to ask monks for support, to support an emperor against the Heike because they're so corrupt. And read these letters, it's a great kind of like Confucian and Buddhist breakdown of what he did and why it's immoral. Now, Heike, if, we were, if you remember, it already kind of collapsed, and the abbot already got fired, and basically Kiyomori took this one over. They were bandits, remember? Mostly bandits now. And then to make sure they didn't help the other temple, he bribed them. <laughs> Lots of bribes. And Nara basically agrees to help. And there's an interminable debate. Uh, this one is... So Nara says, okay, where is this? And the Nara letter is several pages long. But back in Midera, this is in Kyoto again... There's a big debate. Should they fight now or wait? And, of course, there's a Genji, uh, there's a Heike guy here, and he basically stalls long enough so they can't fight well. That's too bad. And then we get the roster of fighting monks. This one is, uh, if you want to know who's fighting, it's literally a giant list of fighting monks. Um... Okay, now we get to our first battle. Uh, I'll spend a little time here, and then we'll be... 
free. It's not that quick of a battle, though, so it'll probably take me 15 minutes. All right. So we have this debate. Uh, we get the roster of fighting monks, and... Um, trying to see if anything here we care about. And there's, there's, there's some tragedy here, but basically the monks and the Mochihito try to march to Nara. They got support. They're like, okay, but we can't stay, so they leave. And as they're leaving, of course, the Heike chase them. And there's something called the Battle of the Bridge. And this is a place called Byodo. It's a famous location nowadays. So the Tyra give chase. They attack on this bridge. And this is where we get some really fun, what I would call... Um, so we get our first... The Minimoto, we see them fight. So Yorimasa, the guy who started this fight, we have a fight on the bridge. They actually pull... If you look at this picture, they actually pull up the bridge tiles to make fighting heroically part of the fight. And uh, this is where we get our first action scenes. I'm not even kidding. And if you haven't read any of this yet, oh my goodness, you need to do it. The action scenes alone are worth it. And there's a lot of really classic Japanese things here. Let me get to it. What was that? Oh, that was me. And this is like hundreds versus thousands, by the way. So it's a serious f fight. Um... And it gives you some indications how this is going to go. Um, Yoromasa Minato, Minamoto wore a long white silk hat, hita, hitatari, which is a cloth, under leather armor with indigo dyed white fern pattern lacing. He must have known this day would be his last, for he left off his helmet. His son... Nakatsuna wore a red brocade under laced armor. This better to draw the powerful bow. He too wore no helmet. Now we get some heroics. This is uh, 227, 228. Now, Tajima slipped his halberd from his scabbard and strode alone unto the bridge. A sight the Heike raised a great shout. Get this fellow men, shoot him down. Their finest archers lined up their bows, fitted arrows to string, and let fly again and again. But he unfades, ducked the high ones, jumped below the low ones. And those coming straight at him, he knocked them down with his halberd and broke. Friend and foe alike watched with awe. So it was forever after they called him Tajima Snapshaft. <laughs> so they get cool <laughs> superhero nicknames too. Uh, there's among the practitioner monks one... Tsutsui no Jomyo Meishu, wearing the darkest indigo under black leathered lacquered armor. A helmet complete with five plated neck piece and a black lacquered sword. Again, now do you see why I gave you the picture? He bore on his back 25 arrows, fletched with black feathers. He carried a bow of black leather, black lacquered over classly wrapped rattan, and grasped a mighty halberd with a plain shaft he favored. So equipped, he marched into the bridge and called out with a great voice, You have long heard tell of me. Now here I am, before your eyes. At Midera, everyone knows me, me, the practitioner monk. Tsutsui no Jomyo Meishu, a man stalwart against a thousand. Any of you with the stomach for it, come and fight me. See how you do. Oh, we crashed. Man, I'll keep reading, and then we'll keep talking. All those arrows in his rapid suggestion, he let the string and let it fly. And it looks like we're back. Give it a second. Uh, on my end, it's still dropping frames, still dropping frames, still dropping frames. Oh, I love the internet. We're back. Great. Uh, where did I leave off? Did you did I did you guys hear Tajima Snapshaft and Jomyo Meshu? Yeah, the internet doesn't like me today. Especially tonight, I think everybody's streaming, uh, I'm sure they're just streaming this. They would never, you know, stream porn or anything, but, you know. <laughs> the night has slightly more demand on the bandwidth, I think. Was it the first guy with the halberd, Richardson, or the second guy with the halberd? The guy, did we get to the guy doing Matrix to the Arrows? That's what I want to know. First guy, okay. We did not get to Matrix Arrow Guy. I'll reread it. In the recording, it'll sound a little weird. 
But uh, it's only two minutes. You guys rewatching it. If you rewatch this far, it'll be fine. So here we go. So this is the, to refresh this guy. This is Tajima, the first guy. Um, the finest archers lined up their bows, fitted their arrows to string, and let it fly. Again and again, he, unfazed, ducked the high ones, jumped the low, and those coming straight at him, he knocked down with his halberd and broke. Friend and foe alike watched with awe. So it was forever after they called him Tajima Snapshaft. There was among the practitioner monks one, Tsutsui no Jomyo Meishu, wearing the darkest indigo under black lacquered armor. He carried a boar and a halberd and twenty-four arrows, and grasped a mighty halberd in a plain shaft he favored. So equipped, he marched into the bridge and called out with a great voice, You! will have long heard of me. Here I am now before your eyes. At Midera, everyone knows me. Me, the practitioner monk. Tsutsui no Jomyo Meishu. A man stalwart against a thousand. If any of you have the stomach for it, come and fight me, see how you do. Those arrows of his rapid succession he set to the string and let fly. Twelve men within bowshot died. Eleven wounded. In his quiver, only one last arrow remained. With a clatter, he dropped the bow, un untied the quiver, let it fall, kicked off his fur boots, and barefoot, he darted across the bridge on a beam. Nobody else dared follow. Down this to him, broad avenue, six men came at him from the far end. Five he mowed down with his halberd, but the fierce clash with the sixth broke his ha shaft. He tossed it away, drew his sword, and went on fighting. And then we get a special move. The spider strike, the twisted rope, the four-armed cross, the dragonfly, the water wheel. What sword of his slashed through all eight directions, until eight men lay dead before him. On the helmet of the ninth, down it came. With such force, the blade broke at the hilt. Flew off, splashed into the river. A dagger now, his only weapon. In battle frenzy, he faced death. Came up behind him, then... Ichi Ichirai, a monk servant of the Adek Keshu. A wizard at swift swordplay joined the fray, but the beam was too narrow and he could not pass. Leaning his hand on Jomyo's helmet, he, with a pardon me, Ichirai jilept over him and lit into the foe. In that battle he died. Meanwhile, Jomyo crawled back again on the grass at Byodo Ein Gate. He took off his armor and counted 63 arrow hits. Five had gone through, but did done little damage. He burned Moksa over the wounds, swathed his head with a lank of cloth, donned the white raiment of a pilgrim, cut down his bow to make a shaft, or staff, and with simple clogs on his feet, started for Nara, calling the name. <laughs> and that's what a warrior monk is. <laughs> Oh my goodness! That's only one scene of the battle, folks. Like this book's elaborate. They got a lot of they got a lot of fight scenes. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> that time it didn't cut out. Thank goodness, and thank goodness I'm doing a local recording. So okay, and then that's that. Though that gives you kind of the fierce battle, and now uh, basically inspired the whole army to fight for the the bridge, and uh, the Heike aren't that dumb, so they're like, uh, let's let's do something else. And one of the lords, and he's actually an Ashikaga, who eventually becomes the Shogun. Um, he has a brilliant idea, using his family's history, where he's like, dude, we'll just swim across the river. That's fine. And we actually get a great picture for this. Let me open it. Ooh, I gotta flip that one too. Him and 300 of his men swim across the river. And if you look here, right, they're literally on horses with full armor, and they swim across the river to go across that bridge. Why? How many monks would you want to fight on a bridge? Come on. That is a fair question. So the, the Heike do an end around move, basically, where they were, they go from the side of the bridge. And then we get our second Samurai Trallens. These are, these are fun. You already got to hear one, but you're going to hear a second one. Because I heard of, I'll tell you, here we go, yeah, Death of the Prince. So, spoiler, the prince dies. Uh, this guy who routed the river, um, the Ashikaga, this is his challenge. You in the distance hear my voice. Closer behold me with your eyes. Mata Taro, 
Tata, Taratsuna is my name. I am the son of Ashikaga, Taro, Toshitsuna, and I look back over ten generations to Tawara, no Toda Hidezado, who slew the rebel Masakado, and granted a rich reward. This is my seventeenth year. For such as me, without an officer rank, to challenge a prince, to draw the bow and let arrows fly, is to invite wrath of heaven. Yet might of arms and divine favor all lie with Heike. Let any ally of Yorimasa who wishes to test me come forward, I will oblige. With this he charged through Byodoing gate, and a melee ensued. And then the Heike charge. Now why did I read that? Uh, I'll tell you a secret, I studied a lot of Japanese history, and I heard of these challenges. Like, they, they allegedly exist until like, the ninth, until, like, the 16th century, they're really popular. But I'd never heard a full one until I read this book. And it's just fun to hear, like, the guy took his time to, like, announce his lineage and his name and his rank and what he's about to do to you, and then he charges. <laughs> Welcome. Now, the prince's death, that's what this one's called, right? Um, what does that mean? The prince dies. This is Mochihito. Um, what happens? Uh, well, after this, after routing the bridge, right, they start to win against the Genji and these monks. So they start to fight. They start to lose the fight. Um, the prince dresses like a monk and runs for it. Uh, the Genji fight to the death, basically. The cutest story is Yoramasa, the... Uh, the, the dad of this, like the leader of this group, one of, he basically, this is what's like, in, in a tale of the Heike sense, it's cute. Uh, he gets wounded, and before he dies, he gets, he kills him, he gets to his retainer and says, I'm going to kill myself, please cut my head off. Actually, he says, cut my head off, and the retainer says, I can't kill you, you're my lord. He's like, okay, I'll kill myself, please cut my head off and hide it. So his retainer, after he kills himself, cuts his head off, ties his hair to a rock, throws it in the river. And that is a happy ending for him. Welcome for, to a different ethic. Why is it a happy ending? Because they can't prove he died. Um, and then the prince, running for it, has a couple, like, 50 guys with him. And this is the worst part. He almost makes it all the way to Nara, where thousands of monks are waiting for him. And basically a mile out, the Heike figure out where he's going, capture him, beat his monks, kill him, take his head. So the prince that was leading this first rebellion is dead. And then we get... Uh, the prince's son leaves the world. How are we doing on time? We're doing okay. Um, and this is Mochihito's son. He has many sons, but he has a preeminent son back in the capital. And once he's dead, they realize he has a son, and they, they basically planned to kill him. But they had pity on him because he's like a kid. He's like seven. So they let him become a monk forever, which, again, kind of a happy ending. All right. I want to point out, too, uh, oh, who is this? Yeah, after characters die, they tend to get backstory in this. Like, you get kind of emotionally attached to them, and then they tell you about them. So, for example, Tojo is the, is the chapter that just talks about kind of the premonition of this rebellion coming and the backstory of Yorimasa's family. So, this is a very common strategy. You even learn about how he got promoted by, for example... Uh, he was really good at poetry. He didn't get promoted until he was like in his sixties, and he would he was he like killed a mythical beast for the emperor by like shooting a bow at night in the dark. Like the guy apparently had semi like supernatural powers, but he still lost and died. So that's too bad. But again, we get his, these both are his backstory. So we learn his poetic skill, his archer ability. We get to learn a little bit about him, and they show you he's kind of a good guy after he's dead. All right. Uh, and then finally, we're going to end here. The burning of Midera. So Mount Hei, the big capital that's part of the same sect of Buddhism, is totally silent. They do not help Midera at all. They asked for help. They sent that petition earlier. No aid. And uh, Kofukuji, which is the... We'll see pictures of it next time. It's the temple in Nara, is too far away and has been declared an enemy of the court. And especially because... The prince who led the rebellion died. They kind of lost their direction. And then Kiyomori's sons attack this temple. They lay siege to it, basically. And then we get some backstory of how old this temple is and how venerable it is and all the collection of arts it has and all the Buddhist sutras. And then we get into the loss. Uh, and it's they, after they fight the monks for a whole day, 
Uh, they burn it all to the ground with all of its treasures. And to quote the thing, it just shows what lies ahead. Soon enough, the Heike will find that they have had their day. Not a happy ending for the Heike. All right. And we're going to leave it here. This is the end of chapter five, or four, sorry. So from next class, we're going to do five to probably 11. Now, obviously, we can't go this pace, right? So we're going to hit the big story arcs, like our temple's burning. Our, is there something happening? We'll probably skip lists, right? We'll do some individual fighting and individual courage, some culturally distinctive things. But uh, I think there's a natural stopping point. Do I want to do one more slide? Hold on. I don't really want to do one more slide. So, okay, for now then, the question becomes, any questions? This seems like a good part. My voice is tired enough. We're about ten minutes early, but, I mean, it doesn't actually bug me. Anything that I mentioned or titles or part of the story or kind of like the narr the wider narrative that doesn't make any sense, we got about ten minutes now, so this is a good time to ask questions. So any questions, you can ask me now, typed for the stream, and uh, if you don't have any... I'll do a couple announcements in the Discord and we'll go home. But uh, now is the time to ask. Oh, also, yeah, no, no, no. For now, we'll leave it there. So I'll be at my boys yelling. He's like, Dad, it's time to play. Okay, okay. But he's been good today. But yeah, and if you haven't started reading it yet, I highly recommend it. Why? Like we talked about, the papers in two weeks. So you have to have known some of the story. And this is only the, like, the setup, right? We haven't actually got to the... The, you know, all the fighting and then the payoff at the end. All right. And I'm trying to give us time considering the 30-second-ish delay of the stream. So, although it looks like we're doing pretty good on time. Oh, well, yeah, okay. Somebody made an all-go-home, already-home. All right. We are in quarantine land, so... Go home is relative, I know. I see one person typing, and if it's a question, I'll answer it. Otherwise, I'll do some final wrap-up in the Discord. Uh, somebody says, I'm amused at how a lot of people in the story seem to be really bad at the monk thing. Yeah, there seems to be, and the Buddhist theology, would this would make sense. There seems to be a direct connection to how much power somebody has to how bad of a monk they are. That's what makes Shigamori interesting. He's basically a good Buddhist, not a monk, until the very end. And he's a guy with lots of power and skill. Mostly the women and the children and defeated people are great monks. Uh, but the people with power seem to be quite horrible monks. Yes, that is a good observation. And a Buddhist would say, that's because they have too much attachment to this world to be a good, all the money and power and stuff and fighting is attachments, so you can't really be a good monk. I mean, I don't know, you couldn't be a good Christian monk either, right? Like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian monk, and on the side, I'm a warlord. <laughs> Probably most Christians will give you a hard time for that, too. All right, I don't see any other observations, so I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you, everybody, who has watched. Uh, if you're re-watching this, great. If you're a community member, welcome. Uh, we'll be back next Wednesday and finish up this book. Um, if you've never read it, I recommend reading it. If you're a student, you have to read it, so that's part of the fun. All right, I'll see you all soon. Thanks for watching.